One of the advantages of a show like Doctor Who is that, like a comic book superhero, you don't need to start at the very beginning to get a handle on the series. You're more than capable of simply starting wherever you want to, and indeed, when I try to get people into the classic era of Doctor Who, I never recommend that they start with an unearthly child. I'll instead recommend something like City of Death, or Remembrance of the Daleks, or Tomb of the Cybermen, which was my very first classic Who story. However, as with Discworld, while an unearthly child isn't necessarily the best start, it is the beginning of Doctor Who, and it provides the origin story of the Doctor. So, after people do dip their toes into the most famous classic serials and decide they want to watch the whole series, this is where they begin. But even if it's important, is it any good? Only one way to find out. An Unearthly Child is, depending on who you ask, one four-episode serial or two separate serials, the first being one episode and the next being three. The latter classification, though, is something of a minority opinion, with most people, myself included, considering this one four-part story, and that's how they classify it for the home video release and target novelization, so that's how we're doing it here. An Unearthly Child is mainly known for two things. Firstly, as we mentioned earlier, it's the first Doctor Who story, the one where it all started. But secondly, and less happily, it's infamous for the legal battles waged by the son of the author of its screenplay, which has resulted in it being the only classic serial to not be available on BBC iPlayer as of the making of this video. If you, like me, don't live in a country with access to BBC iPlayer, then this may not make much of a difference to you, but I bring it all up to explain why it might take a while for this video to come out safely, and why when it does come out, there might be weird filters or dancing anime cat girls prancing about. So, what's the story? Well, there's a child, see? Susan Foreman, and there's just something, dare I say, unearthly about her. Yes, yes, she excels at certain subjects at school, yet she doesn't understand some of the most basic everyday information. For example, she's far better at chemistry than her science teacher, Ian Chesterton, but when talking to her history teacher, Barbara Wright, she revealed an assumption that the UK was using decimalized currency of all things. Curious about their student, Ian and Barbara both ask about her home life but find details sparse and Susan tight lipped, which turns their curiosity into worry. Fearing potential domestic abuse or neglect, instead of shrugging their shoulders, Ian and Barbara decide to follow Susan home. To their surprise, though, home turns out to be a junkyard, inside of which is an old man and a police box. Hearing Susan's voice in the box, Ian and Barbara break inside, but the old man subsequently kidnaps them and whisks them away in the police box that is actually a time machine and Ian and Barbara must find a way to get back home. If you watch An Unearthly Child after watching New Who, or even after watching most classic Who stories, you'll probably be quite shocked by it. Indeed, almost nothing you recognize from the show is in the serial, and that which is, is always just slightly different from the form you're familiar with. Case in point, while the TARDIS is largely the same magic box we're familiar with, and is just as much a piece of junk then as it is now, the name TARDIS is one that Susan made up, rather than what the Time Lords call all their time travel machines. And as for the Time Lords, no mention of them is made here at all. At this point, we know nothing about the Doctor, only that he comes from a time and place not of 1960s Earth, and that he is a horrible old man. Yes, this Doctor is much more Doctor Smith than the Doctor Who we all know and love. He's petty, childish, bombastic and brash, and an altogether unpleasant individual. If anything, he's a millstone around Ian and Barbara's necks as they attempt to survive the harsh realm they've been thrust into, and he even goes so far as to try and bash a wounded caveman's head in because he was slowing down their escape. Quick side note here, but this is actually a scene that gets referenced and replicated in other Doctor Who episodes, and is often pointed to to demonstrate how far the Doctor's come as a character since his introduction. What intrigued me about it as I rewatched the serial this time, though, was that it doesn't actually play out the way it does in future references. In callbacks to the scene, the rock is held high above the head, poised to be brought down on top of another head. But in the original story, the Doctor's rock is small and sharp, with him slipping it stealthily into his sleeve so he can kill the caveman with a much more calculating cruelty. The rock-raised high image does actually occur in Child, but it doesn't involve the Doctor. It happens instead during the final confrontation between the two rival cavemen, whose power struggle the TARDIS team stumbled into by accident. However, 
I can see why the scene of the Doctor and the Wounded Cavemen gets referenced so often, because despite almost nothing in the serial reflecting the elements we've come to regard as axiom of Doctor Who, this one scene demonstrates the central underlying thesis of the show. The Doctor is not yet the Doctor in An Unearthly Child. He doesn't even call himself that, the name being something Ian and Barbara call him for lack of a better name available. And when the old bastard is about to kill the cavemen, it's Ian who stops him. This is fascinating because typically the Doctor is the one who does that sort of heroic thing, who helps people become better versions of themselves. But at this point in time, it's the Doctor who needs to become better. The story of an unearthly child is driven by people being weak in some capacity and by other people inspiring them to do better. Each of the four TARDIS travelers helps comfort, uplift, or save each other in some way, and the plot is all about them helping a tribe of cavemen make fire. However, what's important is that this inspiration has ripples far beyond the character's actions, and not all of these ripples are positive. Yes, by the end of the story, our heroes have helped uplift a tribe of cavemen, but only just a little bit. The said tribe's own prejudices and weaknesses cannot be rectified from a single act of intervention, however benevolent. And while Team Tardis has learned to at least work together, they are far from trusting one another. At this point, you couldn't even say that they like each other that much. But with the Tardis as unpredictable and uncontrollable as always, it looks like Team Tardis are stuck together, for better or for worse. Despite An Unearthly Child being the first Doctor Who serial, it wasn't until 1981 that it got novelized, as part of the publicity leading up to the show's 20th anniversary. Why is this, you may wonder? Well, mostly it's because the next serial after Child was... The Daleks, which first introduced viewers to those dastardly pepperbots and whose novelization decided to combine the origin story aspects of Child into its own plotline, thus rendering a novelization of Child itself largely redundant. Honestly, I think if not for the show's 20th anniversary coming up, and that coinciding with the show's focusing its attention on the hardcore fandom, i.e. the only people back then who knew or cared that there was a Doctor Who story before the Daleks, we might never have gotten a target novelization of An Unearthly Child, especially once the VHS releases less than a decade later rendered a novelization obsolete. But get a novelization we did, and what do you know, it's by Terence Dix! Hey! <laughs> We should discuss him in more detail later down the road, but for now, all you need to know about Uncle Terence is that he was an old hand of Doctor Who, and could be relied on up until his death to crank out an entirely serviceable script or novelization. And that's what you get with this book. There's not too much difference between the plot of the serial and the plot of the novel. Ian and Barbara notice their student Susan is strange, they investigate, stumble into the TARDIS, are kidnapped by the Doctor, and subsequently get captured by cavemen in the midst of a power struggle they have to escape. Apart from a few stray scenes and lines of jokes about how, yes, there really was once a time when England did not use decimalized currency and walkie-talkies were thought of as hulking monstrosities only army men used, the novel and the serial are pretty much interchangeable. The only major differences between the two works I can see is that the novel adds a scene detailing the aftermath of Ian and Barbara's disappearance and the effect it had on the community. And it also has Susan ding the radiation meter at the end to explain why it suddenly sprang to life without warning in the original serial's ending. And yeah, this kind of makes sense. If the impetus behind this target book was to remind everyone that there was a Doctor Who story before the Daleks, then you would want to preserve as much of that story as possible in its pages. And given Terence Dick's primary skill being able to evoke much with few words, he was probably the best candidate to cram as much of the serial story as anyone could into a bite-sized paperback. More than that though, the story of an unearthly child is really quite good. I mean, yeah, it doesn't resemble Doctor Who as most people recognize it, and there's a bit of the old Billy Hartnell racism there. Now, now, don't get exasperated, Susan. Remember the Red Indian. When he saw the first steam train, his savage mind thought it an illusion too. But it's tightly plotted, well-paced, and a lot deeper than you might expect. I certainly found it a lot more enjoyable than I expected when I rewatched it recently. The goal of a TV pilot is, ultimately, to get you wanting more. And after watching An Unearthly Child, even if you may be put off by how unfamiliar and unusual it feels, I reckon you're at least intrigued to see where things are going. So, even if it's not a good start per se, I would say it's definitely a good story.
Since the story of the Unearthly Child serial and novel are pretty much the same, and since there aren't any missing episodes of the serial, I think I can safely side with the serial on this one. So that's one serial, zero novel thus far. And given how many Terrence Dix novelizations there are out there, I'm eager to see if any of them exceed their source material, or if an Uncle Terrence novel by definition will only ever be a faithful adaptation of the TV serial. The only way to find out, though, is to keep at the series, so I'll see you in the next one. In the meantime, if you like this video and would like to help this channel out, please consider liking, commenting, or subscribing. Don't forget to ring that bell if you want to catch new episodes each Saturday Tea Time, and don't forget to share this video to help boost it in the algorithm. Thank you all for watching, and a special thank you to the BBC, Dominic Noble, and the Coburn Estate for not suing the pants off of me. Bye bye.